first rule of approximation is? As I can talk loud, baby. The first order of approximation is? As it. Once we try approximating, well, we know this is true. And we know this is true. As I come to you, Kisa. Please. Okay. Oh, no. okay. Fine, just finish it and come. This doesn't cut it because, of course, we're not looking at lines. We're looking at curvy things. Otherwise, we wouldn't be using Taylor approximation. So we can move on to the second order. Now, the second order is much harder to justify using the same methods. So we're going to use something called the integral. So uh, we know this is true, so we can extrapolate it to say this is true. F prime of x is approximately f prime of a plus f double prime of a times f minus a. Right. So uh, we have uh, this formula, and now what we're going to do is we're going to integrate on both sides with respect to x. Fundamental theory of calculus is going to be that. Well, not fundamental theory of calculus, by the definition of it. Please don't show the seats. There's literally no one here. Focus on that. It's approximately f prime of a times f. We live together, Dad. You can kiss me anytime you want, just not now. Plus f prime prime of a times x squared over 2 minus a times f prime prime of a times x. So now, here, let's look at this. We have f prime of a times x plus f double prime of a times x squared over 2 minus 2ax. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. So, let's compare this to the actual formula for the second order. f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a f prime of a plus f double prime of a times x squared times 2ax plus a squared over 2. So as you can see, a handful of terms in the original are missing from this one. Why? Well, notice they're all constant terms. Because this is an indefinite integral, we forgot to add the plus c. Now, how can we prove this plus c is exactly the same as all these three missing terms? Well, I was originally misled at first, but uh, Professor Khan showed me this is actually extremely simple. Let's pretend that we already have all these constants and we add a new one, C. So now, let this be equal to F of X. Now, plug in A. The Taylor approximation is supposed to be completely accurate at A specifically. It's centered. 
So now, if we plug in A, we get f of A <coughs> plus A f prime of A minus A f prime of A plus f prime prime of A, and it should be pretty obvious when you plug in A here, this goes to zero, so this whole term doesn't even exist, and this term doesn't exist either, so just leave the C. So that just gives us f of a equals f of a plus c. So we subtract or add nothing. c is 0. These are exactly the constant terms that we're looking for. So that is the proof of the Taylor approximation, but we're not done yet. So let's move back to this. How can we prove the Taylor approximation of e to the x? Well, first of all, recall that d dx of a of x is equal to a to the x ln a. So now, what happens if we plug in e? e to the x equals e to the x plus ln e, which is just 1. So that means we get d to the dx e of x equal to e of x. And this is true for any order of the derivative. So, that means that what is our Taylor expansion? Well, it looks like this. f of x is equal to, uh, well, f of a, so e to the a, plus f prime of a, which is the same as f of a, times x minus a, then we had f double prime of a, which is the same thing, times x minus so on and so forth. Now, we're going to take the Maclaurin series for this one uh, because that's a simple. But you can prove for yourself that it's the same with the Taylor series, general Taylor series. So, uh, with the Maclaurin series, A equals zero. So let's factor out all the E's for a second. We get one plus X minus A plus X minus A squared over two factorial so on and so forth. So, then when you set a to zero, this on the outside becomes one, on the inside becomes one, plus x, plus x squared over two factorial, plus x cubed over three factorial, and so on and so forth. So we get a very simple expansion, the sum for n equals one to k of, well, zero, actually, x to the n, uh, x to the n divided by n factorial. So that's e. Now, that's one side of the equation over with. Well, actually, not really. You see, instead of x, let's plug in i to the x, which is the part I was missing that Dr. Khan showed me. So, please, guys, stop. Especially you, Dad, please. I'm really not pleased anymore. So we get. But Daddy loves you. Shut up. <coughs> one plus i x plus the thing about i is that. Wait, that's three. wrong. You have to substitute i for x. We're plugging in i x for x. We're trying to find e to the i x is expansive, not just e to the i. Okay, good. You're a disgusting mom. So, one plus i x plus or rather minus x squared over 2 factorial, because i squared is minus 1, minus i x cubed over 3 factorial, and it alternates every four terms. So it turns to normal by x to the fourth plus some dot dot. All right, so now let me show you something. Let's separate this into 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial. You lost me long time ago. Good. 
<coughs> oh. I didn't want to find you in the first place. That's cosine x. Cosine x. Yes, genius. I'm gonna prove that. Stop spoiling the surprise. Plus i times sine x. Okay. Three factorial plus x to the positive over five factorial until. Now, is this loser spoiled? This is cosine's expansion, and this is sine's expansion. But well, let's prove that. So, I'm going to make some new space over here, because really, you should have written, written these things down a long time ago. And then we get... Um, Demo, it is this part of bot. Oh, I don't know. No. Be fast. Be fast. <coughs> Baby, daddy loves you. Also, discuss it. That's a differential form of Maxwell's equations on your shirt. They should be the integral forms. Why? I bet, you don't, complex. Oh. I bet you don't even know how to write the why integral forms. Why you have forms. to be like... I don't. Why you have to like be Barnard, Barton Russell? Mm -hmm. One plus one is two. Can you shut two. up? Okay. <laughs> how many pages he had to write to prove one plus one is two? Three hundred three. And Wait. you think that was okay? Yes. I think he wasted half his life. You always have to be rigorous. Disgusting. So, 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x squared over 4 factorial equals 1. So on and so forth. Now, let's take the Taylor expansion of cosine x. That's just going to be <coughs> sine a minus sine a times x minus a. Plus, you guys have class here? Oh, no, I, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I just need to change something on my yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not using the microphone anyway, so that doesn't really make a difference. Cosine a times x minus a squared divided by 2 factorial. And you should hopefully see a pattern here, because when I take the derivative again, you get sine a times x minus a cubed over 3 factorial, so on and so forth. Now, when we take the Maclaurin series, sine of 0 is 0, and cosine of 0 is 1. So we get 1, this goes to 0, this goes to 1, this goes to 0, the entire term is that. So that's why every... Uh, odd term disappears. So we get 1 minus x squared over 2 plus 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial and so on. So that's cosine proof and it's a similar process for sine. We get sine a plus cosine a times x minus a squared, no, cosine a times x minus a divided by no, not divide by anything because one factorial is just one. Um, minus sine a to the x minus a squared over two factorial plus sine uh, cosine. No, wait a second. Minus cosine a times x minus a cubed over three factorial. And now. When we plug in 0 for a, we get 0 over here, 0 over there, 1 over here, and 1 over there. So we get x minus x cubed over 3 factorial, and hopefully you see the pattern. So that means that we've officially proved, through proving the Taylor series, proving the expansion of e to the x, proving the expansion of cosine and the expansion of sine, which is all we did in that one hour long session, e to the i x equals cosine x plus i sine x.